time, precious time with us and share their experience, sharing their experience with us. And we are going to discuss um, IPMN today um, in two ways. I mean, conservative and surgical aspects of IPMN. Uh, as all we know, we know about the worrisome features and the other definitions. Uh, and it has been emphasized nicely in every society, including European and African uh, HPV society as well. But today we are going to revisit these uh, properties, these definitions. And the first, um, the first we are going uh, to listen Dr. Yanis Passas. Um, he's going to talk in favor of surgery or um, the selection of patients for surgery. And then we are going to receive only written questions. There's not any, uh, there's not any raised hands. Just write your questions. Um, and at the end of every speaker, we are going to discuss for a couple of minutes. It's up to the number of questions, of course. And then uh, at the end, the Darwinist is going to make a conclusion and make a comment. Thank you. Okay. Yanis, we are waiting for you. Okay, so uh, thank you for the invitation and uh, for this wonderful opportunity to get together. Well, uh, as uh, Professor Soker said, I'm going to be a little bit biased for surgery regarding the IPMNs and the management. Uh, we generally use three classifications to characterize the lesion that we have in front of us, the cystic lesion. And that's the location, the histology type, and the grade of dysplasia. As of usefulness for, uh, for clinical practice, the location through the imaging, it is the first thing that we get in touch and we start evaluating. Then the histology type and the grade of dysplasia, unfortunately, it's very difficult to assess before uh, we decide whether to resect or not. Sometimes we do, sometimes we're not, and we're not so sure, and that's a very gray area. And uh, regarding the anatomical position, we can say that we have the main duct IPMNs when there is a dilatation of the main pancreatic duct above the five millimeters. The branch duct where accessory um, side branches are dilated up to five millimeters and they are communicating with a non-dilated main duct, it's, it's normal. And then the mixed type, when we have both dilatation of the branch duct and the main pancreatic duct. Now, regarding those three types, according to location and microscopic, uh, let's say, uh, image, uh, we usually diagnose these lesions between the sixth and the seventh decade of, uh, uh, of life. And uh, there are quite uh, a bit in the middle between female and male presence. And regarding malignancy, the, we have reports for the branch duct IPMN from 3 to 25% and a quite a double number for the mixed and the main duct IPMNs. So regarding also the epithelial type for the main duct IPMN, intestinal is what we see the most. And uh, about a third can be low or medium grade dysplasia. High grade dysplasia or, can or cancer the majority, and from that, the 39% can be even invasive cancer. So regarding the uh, five-year specific survival rate for the main ductile payments can be up to 83%, and the recurrence rate in 10 years time can be up to a quarter. So this is quite high. Regarding the branch ducts, it's the most, uh, Frequent it's that elements in finding on uh, for the pancreatic touch. Often it's solitary, but it can be multifocal. And when it's multifocal, it cysts should be evaluated separately. Okay, and 17% it's the overall risk of developing cancer when we find the branch duct IPMN on the pancreas. And here there is a slight uh, majority of females towards females in the presence, the incidence. IPMN can be up to 40%. Sorry. Yanis, can sorry. Be up um, to 40%. Yes. We can't see, uh, I can't see your slides. Is you, you can't. Yeah, I can. Did you share your screen? Yes, yes. 
I'm on sharing mode. We are seeing the slides, uh, Ahmed. I don't know. Yeah, I can. Probably my, my. Okay. Sorry for interrupting. Please keep Maybe going. Maybe you're not in, in full screen, Ahmed. You're not in oh, full okay. screen. Did you yeah, fix I it? I could change my agenda. Okay. Please keep going on. Thank you. Okay. So mixed types can uh, can, uh, can be met up to forty percent of uh, of high payments. They have up to forty five percent risk of developing cancer. Males are predominant here, and the mean age of diagnosis is sixty four years old. So another important feature is the epithelial type. There can be four types: gastric type, intestinal, pancreatobiliary type, and oncocytic type. Uh, each of them will uh, give a different type cancer and it have different probability at the time of the diagnosis or the histology after resection to have from low grade to, uh, or high grade dysplasia to carcinoma. From those, the, bran the branch duct, as we said, uh, the gastric type is the most, uh, most frequent one and most frequently it's low grade. But when it is carcinoma, it's one of the most invasive ones. In the main duct type payments, uh, we uh, find intestinal, pancreatopiliary, or constricted type to be uh, most uh, frequent. And from those, pancreatobiliary type is one of the most um, aggressive ones. Now, uh, all, all those uh, epithelial types share common uh, features regarding their carcinogenesis and their mutations. And uh, um, the most, let's say, close to the, panc the uh, panc uh, pancreatic duct type cancer is the tubular can carcinoma, which they can share k mutation that is you know, is very uh, popular regarding the uh, lipid duct. And the intestinal type often gives colloid carcinoma. Now, we can see this mutation and the frequencies here. They're quite different from, uh, for each uh, type. And the progression to inv invasion, uh, that as does, differs. So they produce different types of uh, overall survival. And the best is uh, the intestinal one. The worst is the pancreatobiliary one, being in the middle, the oncocytic and the gastric one. And we can see that also regarding the recurrence after resections having the best survival after you can the intestinal life payments and the worst the pancreatobiliary. And as you can see on the, uh, the right side of this slide, the, um, the survival between the patients that have the classic tubular adenocarcinoma and the IPM and pancreatobiliary type, they overcome each other. So this is a question whether pancreatobiliary type cancer, uh, IPM should be uh, treated as pancreatic cancer patients. So in the, in the past days, the dysplasia grade went from adenoma to dysplasia to borderline to carcinoma and to invasive carcinoma. And uh, this we saw, it didn't serve uh, many purposes regarding translating to the overall survivor. And on the eighth edition of the TNM, this changed. And we have one type low grade, which is the IPMA, the adenoma, and the second time high grade epithelia dysplasia, which is the IPMC, it's carcinoma. Then the carcinoma can be invasive or non-invasive. And uh, the process between adenoma going to invasive carcinoma has the classic pathway of carcinogenesis with upregulation and downregulation of cellular proliferation processes, and it's quite alike. It usually starts from many clones with different mutations, like a cousin to the pancreatic cancer adenocarcinoma, and some clones gain the, uh, let's say, the advantage uh, between uh, uh, proliferating and the control of the organ. And thus, we start having dysplasia, which progresses to cancer. This progression can be different from the panin progression one, two, and three to pancreatic cancer. The remaining question is, and has different kinds of mutations also, in, the, in its timeline. The only question we have right now is that the uh, low-grade panin, if it can uh, produce a low-grade IPM and dysplasia, which we don't know. When cancer comes upon an IPM, it can happen in, in three ways. It can happen uh, in a sequential way, as we have seen, with the different types of, uh, of sequential carcinogenesis. It can become 
through a clone that gains the advantage of living as a, as a dysplastic clone. So this is the branch of type. Or it is an organ that something is happening and a lot of, of mutations are happening. So in that organ, we can have a de novo, uh, uh, a de novo cancer, appearance of a pancreatic cancer. So these three types have also seen, we've seen that they have a different, uh, a different survival type with the worst being the de novo appearance of cancer, intermediate, the sequential one, and the best, the branch of. Uh, overall, in the APMNs, we have a 40% risk of progression to invasive pancreatic cancer, and the five-year overall survival can be from zero to 64%. And uh, the knowledge of these key, uh, key chain mutations and their time sequence is of most important factor to the APMN management. But as of now, we can't take any advantage from them. Um, so we've seen that the multi-cloning pre-malignant lesions, they are capable of a stepwise progression to cancer, and their different subtypes will produce different cancer with different overall survivors. And we've seen that they share a lot between the pancreatic ductal and the carcinoma, but they are not exactly twins. They're quite different. And this means different response to treatments and the overall survival. Timing of surgery is of the most important factor here. And this, we can see that the, the difference of the survival between patients that have non-invasive uh, IPMN, so we operate them on time, and patients that we have found invasive cancer, so we were too late to operate them. So when we operate an adenoma, it's maybe it's too early, and we can argue that. High-grade dysplasia, it's on time, and we've done the best of our job. Cancer is too late. So what's, what's the risk in follow-up follow time of IPMNs to progress and have this sequence of carcinogenesis that, that we've seen before? So from the first sign of the diagnosis of an IPMN, the risk of invasive cancer is uh, about 30% almost. Having a high-grade dysplasia and invasive uh, cancer during time it goes up after two years to about 40%. All kinds of dysplasia plus invasive cancer can be up to 65%. Regarding their position in the organ, branch duct type AMNs have an overall risk of 15%. Mixed type and main duct, it's 63%. Pay attention that this is, uh, have been reported in operated and non-operated uh, patients altogether. Not all branch duct type IPMNs are the same, and they are not innocuous in, a, in any case. So we need to select them because, as, as I've said to you before, the uh, invasiveness of a branch duct type IPMN, the risk of invasiveness may be low, but when it's invasive, we've seen that it has such mutations that it's become a very aggressive cancer. So may be low risk, but when the risk comes, it's devastating. Regarding the mixed type IPMNs, then again, not all mixed up IPMNs are all the same. And we have the minimal involvement, which is microscopic, versus the extensive involvement of the main pancreatic duct, which is microscopic invasion. And you can see here in the chart how the minimal uh, involvement of the uh, main duct in the mixed IPMN differs the survival from the main duct IPMN, all right? So the minimal involvement uh, involves usually being a gastric type. It has a low prevalence of high-grade dysplasia and has a, a, a better disease-free survival. The extensive meat, it's quite the opposite. It's intestinal type. It has high prevalence of high-grade and of worse overall survival. Even the low-grade type IPMN Need, we need to be careful of them. They have an 88% overall cumulative incidence of cancer progressing in time. When we use all the criteria that we have in the, uh, in the different guidelines, so when IPMN has no criteria, seems absolutely innocuous, pay attention, it nevertheless, it has a 4.3% of being malignant or having an invasiveness, invasive IPMN. 
Obviously, this percent rises when we have worrisome features or high risk uh, stigma. So low risk for pancreatic cancer and non have developed uh, a pancreatic cancer in linear function according to the years of, of follow-up. And the mean time of this follow-up in different papers, it's around 10 years. <clears throat> the low, low risk IPMN have up to 7.7% risk of developing cancer and the high risk goes up to 25%. Now, this is important. The mean risk per year is 0 0.8 and this remains steady for each year. We haven't been able to prove an increase in the incident, a cumulative increase in the incidence as the year goes on. And this is important, and this is in contrast with the sequential mutation and progression to cancer that we have seen before, and it has been proven in laboratories about the mutations from dysplasia to cancer. So regarding the main background duct, one of the main features of being at risk for cancer, it's the diameter of the uh, main pancreatic duct. And this, uh, when it starts being above five millimeters, the risk starts. And we can see here that there is an area between five millimeters and 10 millimeters where progressively the risk for high grade dysplasia and invasive cancer grows. Above one centimeter, it's certainly it's quite high the risk. So we have the uh, European guidelines and uh, we use the absolute indications and the relative indications to decide whether a uh, patient with IPM needs to go for surgery or not. The absolute indication is, of course, if we have a po positive cytology for malignancy or high-grade dysplasia. If there is presence of solid mant or, or jaundice, we're not talking anymore about a simple IPM. There is a mass there. It behaves like pancreatic cancer when there are enhancing nodules above five millimeters of diameter, and the main pancreatic duct has a dilatation above one centimeter. So there we can easily decide that there is something going on. We need to go for surgery. The relative indications require a growth rate up of five millimeters per year, an increased CA99 in, in the blood serum, main pancreatic duct dilatation between five and, and nine, a cyst diameter of uh, four centimeters, new onset of, uh, of diabetes or uh, IPP-related pan uh, pancreatitis. There, it's something that we need to put on a balance and decide, inform the patient, if the patient is uh, willing to take the risk of surgery and is fit for surgery, should go for surgery. If not, we go for follow-up. So, uh, there is a question of uh, whether what type of resection we need to do when the entire main pancreatic duct is uh, dilated on, on the imaging. Then we need to resect the, the part that's more suspicious is the most dilated. Then we have to do a frozen section of the resection matting and decide whether uh, there is displacement or not to do completion uh, pancreatectomy or not. If there are uh, per peripheral more nodules on the pancreatic duct, then we do total pancreatectomy and there is no question about it. How do we treat uh, mixed type IP IPMNs? We treat them as the main duct IPMNs because more or less the risk of, of malignancy is quite the same and they behave quite the same. Careful here, as I showed to you before, not all mixed types are the same. So we have to dis uh, uh, make a distinction between minimal and extensive invasiveness. Regarding the branch stack type MN, from quite some time now, the Fukuoka uh, guidelines have introduced in our life the high risk stigmata and the worrisome uh, feature, something like all the things that we discussed about the main pancreatic duct. So they, if there is obstructive jaundice and there is enhancing neural nodules and the main pancreatic duct is dilated, then we go for surgery. What is a feature? It's a bit in the grain zone. We need to do a biopsy, EUAs with contrast enhancement, see the neural nodules, see how the cyst is, and then decide. Regarding the European uh, guidelines about this matter, again, we have absolute and relative indications. So the absolute indications are positive cytology, a solid mass, jaundice, enhancing neural nodules, main pancreatic duct dilatation. Relative indication, it's the growth rate 
five millimeters per year a dilatation of the main pancreatic duct between five and nine. This is diameter, which uh, some years before was in the absolute indications. This has changed. Onset of uh, diabetes, pancreatitis, and a small enhancing neural nodule. nodule. So we see here, this is size above uh, 44 centimeters is now a relative indication, which before was an absolute indication. We, we see that it's not has not such a high specificity and sensitivity. What is of most support, important is the more nodules, which is very sensitive about, about showing us that there is something going on there, there is invasive cancer rather than high grade dysplasia. But nevertheless, they have the highest diagnostic power of malignancy. And then it's followed by the main pancreatic duct dilatation, and then we have the thick, thick septum wall. So uh, we've seen that in the branch duct type elements, if they're not resected, they have up to 10 to 15 percent progression of disease. So be very careful about them. Whole pancreas should be surveilled because there is a risk of a new onset of cancer in different areas from the cyst that you are following up. And as I've said before about the uh, cyst diameter regardless of other risk, is again a risk, a risk factor which we need to pay attention to. Nevertheless, it is on the uh, relative criteria. So which kind of uh, surgery uh, should be performed? When we have absolute criteria, then we do an oncological, oncological resection, and there is no uh, question about it with standard lipandinectomy, because there is high risk of presence of cancer in that cyst. If not, we can do parenchyma uh, sparing surgery. We can discuss about it. Or, as Giovanni will show to us, maybe we just follow up. And uh, what about the multifold and branch stack type EMS? So we've said it before, each cyst uh, needs to be evaluated differently and separately about the risk of malignancy. So if we reset, do we follow up? Yes, we do. 70% of patients have developed a new APMN and 60% of them required new surgery. And uh, there was found high incidence of invasive cancer in these patients. So patients after IPMN resection need to be follow up. The risk of developing a progressive IPMN and invasive cancer is 25% at five years. And uh, long-term follow-up is needed until the patient is never is not uh, fit for resection anymore. And we can see that we have a risk of a new APMN, an IPMN on the rese our resection mansion, or have a new invasive cancer. So many that IPMNs, the age difference and the timeline between non-invasive and invasive cancer strongly suggest tumor progression, but we don't know the exact time when this happens. There is uh, a risk from 42 to 60 percent of finding invasive uh, cancer on main duct IPMNs. So all fit, all fit patients should not undergo resection with frozen section of the resection margin. In the branch duct IPMN, non-operative management can only be considered about the gray areas I told you with no high risk features. Progression has been genetically proven, but we don't have the time, as I said before. Not possible yet to accurately estimate the risk of progression from adenoma to cancer. And uh, both main duct and branch duct are capable of the worst. So they need our attention equally. The international guidelines that we have now, um, they offer some advice when to avoid unnecessary resection but we always have to be careful. So there is an area where we can decide easily and we're convinced about it. And there is a whole a lot big area where decision needs to be scaled. The absolute criteria decision is easy. With relative criteria or no worrisome feature, it's a labyrinth. So I'm seeing, uh, showing you this slide. For me, the most important thing when somebody comes at your office and has an imaging of a pancreatic cyst, you try to uh, create the movie. Not only as this chart here uh, shows about the, um, the diagnostic and the therapeutic approach, 
but try to find out, does he have imaging for the past year? What's going on in this organ? And create the movie and uh, fill in all the puzzle. So we have problems about our guidelines and all these uh, papers that I've shown you. They are from surgeons and from surgical series. So there is bias. In the guidelines, it's not enough and uh, not enough evidence. And the biology yet, we can't use it. It's, uh, it's quite uh, too, too, too early for us. So we have to make a balance between the risk, either to do surgery or not, or follow up, and the oncological benefit of the patient. And this is what we need to say. Only precision surgery and oncology will, will give us this uh, answer because the reality is quite complex and there is no risk-free decision uh, in the IPMNs. I thank you very much. Thank you. I'll stop sharing now. Cannot hear you. Cannot hear Ahmed, you. open your microphone. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry, okay. sorry. Okay. I open up. Okay. Thank you, Yanis. It was excellent presentation. I think we have just one question up to now. It was, yeah, it's coming from our president. Uh, Yanis, it, are there any indications for upfront total pancreatectomy as advocated, advocated by some authors? Well, yeah. Well, it's not proven when the, the so we're saying about the branch stack that each cyst needs to be evaluated separately. I have in my mind that for the main duct, all of its parts should be evaluated also separately if we can. We don't have all the means right now. So you have a, di a dilation of 1.5 uh, centimeters between the head and the neck of the pancreas. And then it's 0 0.5 in the body and the tail. Then you do a Whipple's. Okay, if you can, uh, you can do a spyglass and check the rest of the, the pancreatic duct, okay? And if there are no other worrisome features in the rest of the pancreas, I, I think with frozen section of your essential margin having low grade dysplasia, you, you can do uh, a Whipple and a parenchyma preserved surgery. I think there are no series that have demonstrated the benefit in survival for total pancreatectomy in these cases. But if the whole main, if the whole duct is, uh, is dilated and you have from head to, to the tail, uh, 1.5 centimeter main pancreatic duct, I think total is, you know, you have no other choice. Okay. Thank you. Yanis, there are two more questions. One of yes. them is coming from Ankara Mustafa Kerem. And uh, how about the CEA levels and cytologic um, typing? Um, are these two criteria uh, effects? Are these two criteria affecting your decision in terms of treatment of IPMN patients with main duct or branch duct IPMNs? Well, it's it's a different use for the in, from for the main duct. As of, as of now, it's only in experimental basis when you're doing trials that you can use these levels and the sequencing of mutations on the, on the mucus that is producing that you can subtract with, uh, with EUS or doing some kind of ERCT. For the uh, branch stacks, yes, we can use them. I didn't talk a lot about, about that, but still, I think a whole um, chapter about how to use the EUS do cytology, use the, uh, the enhancement of the neuron nodule and the whole um, cyst wall. Okay, so okay. branch duct, yes, you use them. Main duct, still we're, we're finding out. Okay. Um, how about the CA199 uh, levels when you compare? It's on with the CA? relative okay. indications. It's on yeah. the relative indications. Okay. But All right. I, I, must, I must say, okay, if you want to be honest, and my professor is also here to, to confirm it. If we see elevated CA99, we don't sit down. Okay, all right. There are two more questions, it's coming. Um, one of them is coming from Dr. Yusuf Gunai. And if a patient has a five centimeters IPMN in distal pancreas and also five has- centimeters. Five centimeters. centimeters, five in 
uh, five in distal and one centimeter in diameter in pancreatic head. What would you do? Well, one centimeter, as I've said, is in the high risk zone for invasive cancer. So you resect it all. Yeah, you mean total pancreatic tumor? Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Right. He didn't yeah. say five millimeters, he said five centimeters. So I okay. have a five centimeter and one centimeter. So both of them are quite high. Yeah. And another question is coming from Izmir. Would you proceed to total pancreatectomy in a young patient with multifocal IPM and all through the pancreas? I think the, well, your question is answered. Yes, your yeah. answer is yes, right? If, if those, if those multifocalities present the same worrisome feature, yes. If the, because you might have a branch duct or a main duct on the head and the simple cyst on the other, on the, on the other hand, of a very small branch stack type MN with no worries and features, then you don't do. Multifocality okay. is not an indication. Indication is if we have features, high risk stigmata or worries and features in each cyst separately. So does it mean that if, do you use a frozen section during a surgery? For example, if you do a VIPL yeah. procedure yeah. for IP, yeah. okay. If there is, um, um, some cystic lesion on the, your cut surface and it is a low yeah. grade or high grade, yeah. does it make any effect on your decision to... Uh, low grade, you can stop. High grade, no. Okay. You can and, uh, how do you be sure about the rest of the pancreas in terms of high grade? Uh, you can, that, that's the question. You can't you can be sure. You can always, you know, use all the tools, all the tools you have. But if the dilatation is less than a less than one centimeter and you don't have in the imaging any suspicious uh, thickening of the pancreatic duct uh, wall that it's uh, captivating, it's enhancing on imaging, you don't have more nodules, then yes, with quite a bit of safety, you can stop. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. I think there is not any questions. All right. I'm checking. Okay, thank you, Yanis, for your nice presentation. Now we thank are going you all to proceed. For listening. Thank listening. you for the questions. Thank you, thank you. Okay, Giovanni, we are ready to listen to you. Uh, uh, what do you think about the conservative approach to IPMNs, or are you in favor of follow up instead of surgery? All right. All right. I think you are now able to see my screen. Is it yes. correct? Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Professor. Yeah, yeah, we can. Right, so once again, thank you so much for having me. I would like to, um, to especially thanks Professor Cocker for having me and uh, one of my mentors, Professor Dervenis for, for moderating. So Johannes, you, you did actually a great job and, and I, I feel even more honored to speak after you. I, I thought I had to defend my position of being in favor of follow-up, but you did all the job, right? So I, we're not playing the game of being one against each other because your, your, your way of presenting things was absolutely great and did also the dirty job. So I had to take off some slides of introduction because your overview on IPMN was great. So we'll try to add some, some little spice on the discussion as we are dealing with a Turkish and Greek uh, uh, webinar to see if we have even more discussion at the end. So I'll try to defend my position for, for follow-up, okay, on, on IPMN, despite I'm, I completely agree with what uh, Johannes just said. So I could start by saying that to be in the position of favoring follow-up for this patient, I guess is pretty much saying what uh, Hippocrates taught us uh, a while ago, because we always have to keep in mind as pancreatic surgeon that our first thing is do no harm our patient. And when we deal with pancreatic resection, we are absolutely aware of how big we can be harmful with our resection for our patient. So I think that this first concept could be already in favor of being at, at least at the very beginning in favor of the follow-up. But let's go deeper into this concept. You already saw this from Ioannis, but I think this is crucial. When we deal with IPMN, we deal with pre-malignant lesion. So everything we know regarding cancer has to be carefully scaled when we deal with these 
adenoma to carcinoma sequence. So Ioanni said, we have to watch a movie. Well, this is the movie we're watching. Sometimes the end is not so nice, but this is a continuing process. So for us, for surgeons, getting to know this concept is crucial because it means for our intervention that we can either have our gold standard, which is operating on a high-grade dysplasia, that means cancer prevention, 100%, or we can also see our surgery on an invasive IPMN, so something that already developed an invasive component as an early stage treatment if we are following this IPMN. But no questions that theoretically, the goal of our surgery when we watch an IPMN should be the cancer prevention on operating on a high-grade dysplasia. But again, we are not dealing with properly known pancreatic cancer. It's a different entity. So if you try to, to extremize our two positions, I, I made this slide, which is uh, more or less as the one showed by Yannis. If we want to be more on Yannis' side, so if we want to be more aggressive, probably the risk we are running is to resecting too soon an IPMN. And this means that the cost of the surgery in this case could be higher than that of the disease. I'm talking about morbidity and mortality. But on the other hand, if you are too much on my side, let's say, so to follow up too much this IPMN, then we have another risk, which is resecting too late. And in this scenario, the cost of the disease would be then higher than the cost of the surgery because we are arriving too late. So probably we have to be in the middle of these two and none of us is 100% right. So we can be both wrong. Also because, and this has been shown very nicely, but let me stress it once again, we deal also with another guy on the block, which is a concomitant pancreatic cancer. As in the case I'm showing you by this slide, you have a very nice, good looking branch duct IPMN up here. Then you have a free margin where the black arrows are. And then you have very close to the duct, the invasive component. So this evil guy here, which is not actually related to the IPMN, but it's concomitant, okay? It's a, a, a actually a very important entity because I think this is one of the reasons why we are still far away from the right answers to our patient. The existence of concomitant PTAC should always be taken into account. And it's really something that right now is winning against us in our battle to be better doctors for our patients. So let's keep this in mind. So let's start now if, if we want to go through the literature on, of how we did on our disease. Uh, we started from the 80s, as you know, when the IPMN were described for the first time. And at the beginning, the surgical community was actually very much in favor of going to the OR. So they were all on the side of Ioannis because we didn't know what we were dealing with, right? So after more than 20 years of basically resecting uh, most of the IPMN we were dealing with, in around 2006, we started to watch our database and we felt the urge as a community to provide some policies, which are the guidelines. Why was that? Because we wanted to see if we were good enough in finding true precursors of cancer. And when these policies were released, we find out that most of the IPMN were not malignant entities. So we entered into a new era, which is the recent era, which is now more on the side of showing observational series. So now we also have data coming from the observation of IPMN not going to surgery. So this was the question for Johannes, right? So when is surgery needed? And I think that uh, the evidence that we had from the 80s to 2006, and finally uh, from the guidelines showed us uh, some key concepts that I would like to go through very quickly because Johannes already showed you. And what the guidelines showing is actually very clear, even though it's not so easy to go through the guidelines. It's not so easy because sometimes we have even contrasting policies. So we came out with this app. If you don't have it, it's nice to have it in your, in your smartphone. 
because you can, of course, browse the three main guidelines, international, European, and American, and you can even insert your patient. And sometimes it's, it's interesting to find out that for the same case, we can have different policies. So it's even more difficult for a clinician, you know, to stay stick to the guidelines if the policies are not the same. And as a matter of fact, the lesson from the guidelines, if we try to summarize, is that most of the IPM men are not cancers and will never develop a cancer. Therefore, the surgical resection can be avoided in the majority of IPM men. The only tricky thing is finding out when to go for surgery. The surgery has a goal, and we know it, that is preventing the malignant degeneration. Remember the goal of finding high-grade dysplasia, the incipient malignant degeneration can be predicted with high sensitivity, as showed you by Ioannis before me. But at the same time, we know, and we have a, a bunch of literature in this regard, that surgery sometimes will be an overtreatment because the specificity is very low. So what happens in most of the time is we go to surgery for an IPMN, very bad looking IPMN, and then we find out that there is no cancer in there. We have to acknowledge that. So the question was at the beginning, when is surgery needed? And now we know that we have to go to surgery in high risk patient and that our aim is preventing the cancer, accepting that the risk of overtreatment in some case is always present. And at the same time, we know that the reason is this very well known surgical bias because most of the studies comes from subject that has been operated on. So the actual numbers are not those of the real life if we rely only on the patient who have been eventually resected. So my new questions for you, instead of having an answer is, as we know that almost all IPMN needs surveillance at the beginning, do we really need to surveil all the IPMN? Because this is also relevant. I cannot only say, well, just watch all the IPMN and not caring about, for example, the cost or the psychological burden of observing thousands and thousands of individuals with an IPMN. And in this regard, the guidelines are very interesting because while the international and European, they pretty much divide IPMN into low risk for follow-up and high risk for surgery, the AGA guidelines, as you know, for the first time set a possible target for follow-up discontinuation. They say, if there is stability after five years, then you can consider to discontinue the follow-up. And when this was released, actually, it was like a bomb for the community because most of the centers started to look at the data to see if this policy was actually right or not. And as a matter of fact, in terms of evidence accumulation after these policies, we have now way and way more observational series, meaning data, from IPM men that were not resected. So we entered into this new era of large observational series. I show you some of them. This is a paper from the MGH released four years ago. You see that we have relevant rate of malignancy. We all know the data Johannes showed you before, but you see that the malignancy, even after five years, is always there. It's 5%. So this actually rejects the policy of this continued follow-up after five years. We now go back to Europe. This is a study from the group of the San Raffaele Hospital in Milan. And you see that the active surveillance even beyond five years is required because cancer can take place also after five years. So once again, red light to the AGA policy. We now go back to the United States. We're now at the Mayo Clinic of more than 3,000 patients evaluated. And once again, even in the stable cyst, after five years, the rates of malignancy are relevant. So once again, follow up, continue until the patient is surgically fit. And we have also new numbers. I uh, am showing you now some unpublished data on a systematic review that we did in Verona during the last year, just to have fresh data. Once again, observational studies published until 2020 for a total of 24. These are some of the paper that we included. Just to show you some numbers, 20% of the IPMN will somehow progress 
So it means that they will show some features in terms of worrisome feature and iris stigmata. One out of 10 will eventually require surgery. And when we go to surgery on very selected individuals, only one out of four will eventually have malignancy in terms of high grade invasive cancer and concomitant PDAC, which you see counts for 30% of the malignancy. So this is relevant because again, in this algorithm, we always have to take in mind that we don't have just the cancer from the IPMN, we can also have the cancer arising in the rest of the pancreas, which makes things even, even more tricky. What about the time to malignancy development? We wanted to assess whether we can discontinue the follow-up after five years. And even in this systematic review, we have an answer which is no, because the risk of degeneration is always present even five years after the start of the follow-up. So bad news. And my question, so can we potentially stop the surveillance in selected patients seems to have a no as an answer. But we have a big issue. So why don't we try to look at things in a different way? So we introduced this concept of trivial BDIPMN, which means a branch act IPMN without any features of malignancy and which does not develop any feature for at least five years. So like this little thing here as a hole in the pancreas here in the body, you can see it, it's smiling at us because he says, hey, I'm, I'm benign, but we don't really know, right? So this is what we call trivial, stable for five years. Well, but, but of course there are BDIPMN, right? So the risk is no zero. And as a matter of fact, trivial has a risk of having a cancer in which is 1.5%. The median time from diagnosis to cancer is 96 months and the grow rate predict the development of cancer. So they are true BDIPMN. So let's see now if these BDIPMN are at higher risk of developing a cancer than the general population. Because of course, we want to target for discontinue the follow-up. This population needs to be not higher in terms of risk than the general population. So we use this index, which is called standardized incidence ratio, which is the number of cases in the study population on the number of cases expected in the general population followed for the same time as the study population itself. And we found that both all the BDIPMN and the trivial have a higher risk than the general population, which makes sense because they are true branch duct IPMN. However, if we acknowledge that the risk of having a cancer depends on age, then also the general population will have a higher risk as long as it gets older. And if we consider the trivial only on those above the 65 years old of age, then the trivial population you see here is not at higher risk than the general population because the risk of having cancer increase just because the pancreas is there. So only in individuals above the threshold of 65 years old, they could represent a target for follow-up discontinuation. So, Again, do we really need to keep all the patients under surveillance? Probably yes, because what we know right now is that the full cake, okay, all the BDIPMN are at risk of developing worrisome feature and iris stigmata. Only a little bit, a piece of the cake will require surgery and diagnosis. Another little subset will require surgery after follow-up, but then there is another part, okay, this part here in green, of the trivial cyst remaining the same. Those not changing of observation after observation. So those individuals could be a potential target to discontinue our follow-up. Because once again, the concept I would like to stress is that as Ioannis said, risk zero does not exist, but if a cyst is as harmful as the pancreas, then why are we surveilling this individual? So to conclude, this is the conceptual framework that we use in Verona in 2021. So follow me up here. We start with this very first picture, okay? We have the patient and our drop of water, which is our cyst. What we want to consider at the beginning is what is the patient will? Because you know that not all patients are the same. They can be very anxious about their cyst. And this of course 
is important to, to be taken into account. The patient can have comorbidity. It's different to operate on someone who is younger or older. And then we have to consider the surgical risk because we are not doing surgery for melanoma. We're, we are doing surgery for the worst possible cancer in the abdomen. So what we do at the first visit is considering these criteria. So if we have this criteria here in green, meaning jaundice, vascularized mural nodule or solid component or a malignant cytology, we go for surgery up front. If we have a dilatation of five millimeters, recurrent pancreatitis, a cyst of more than three centimeters or an increase in CN9.9, we go to endoscopic ultrasound, which is a great second level diagnostic. If we got the green light, we start observation. And this observation, as Ioannis said, is like watching a movie because we add pictures after pictures after pictures during the time. And in this way, we are able to see the real biology of the cyst. If we have stability, so if nothing changes, then we can continue with the follow-up. But if something happens, then we go back to the first observation and again, we recheck if there are criteria for surgery or criteria for endoscopic ultrasound. During the surveillance, we always consider the psychological burden because those are individuals that needs to underwent MRI every six months or every, or every year. So this is actually heavy for them. And of course, as long as time goes by, we have additional comorbidities and a new surgical risk. So it's tough. It's tough because we always have to reassess every time a different risk for every single patient. And at the end, we have this question, can we end the follow-up at some point? Probably yes, but we need more data to be sure about that. So I'm going to my conclusion, just to uh, underline how important is watching a movie rather than watching a picture. We are now at the Olympic game in 2002. This is the very end of a very important discipline, which is ice skating. This guy in front is the world champion and is by far the first one. And then there is this poor guy who looks like hopeless, but it's the very end of the race. So who would bet on the world champion just by the pictures? I would, I would put my, my money on it, but let's see what happens. This is true, right? So, oh, at the very end, maybe something crazy, maybe it's not usual, but at the very end, you see for, because it was a matter of luck, but the Australian guy became the Olympic uh, winner. So sometimes watching a movie provides us uh, with the very, I would say, uh, tricky conclusions that we cannot have just with the picture. So with the cyst, always watch the movies, as Ioannis said, because only the movie will tell you the true biology. Biology is king. Biology is always the gold medal at the Olympics. So don't trust the picture, always watch the movie. As we want more data, I invite all of you to join this registry, which is called the Munich. It has been done under the auspices of the EHPBA. So I'd like to thank Professor Dervenis for the endorsement. It's a registry, so everyone can join. Drop us an email, you can get more information on the Twitter. And what is important, this is what is providing us the data we need. This is not a surgical series. We can follow this patient during the time and see what is the actual role of mural nodules. So once again, these are the data that we need and this will add to literature providing us with better policies. So just to conclude, I would like to thank the uh, pancreatic team in Verona, our patient for the data that they provide to us and this is, of course, the job not by me, but of an entire team dedicated to the pancreas 365 uh, days a year, also during the COVID. So once again, thank you for having me. And I look forward for a great debate together. Okay, Giovanni, thank you for your excellent talk. Um, I think we have got enough um, information regarding follow-up or surgery. Um, of course, you were in favor of uh, follow-up. Uh, actually, of course you are a surgeon and you are going to be in favor of surgery, but uh, my conclusion is that being much more careful when we decide to follow the patients up. And there is one question, let me, okay. Um, it's coming from Dr. Fuad Aksoy. Do you have 
uh, any biological biomarker to predict become um, the cyst is malignant? So that's a, that, that, that's a future. And uh, I would like this to be the present, but I have to be honest with you. So there are biomarkers, of course, there are a lot of branch new data, and this is actually the direction we are going to. So we even have a different microbiota in the cyst, mm -hmm. eventually related to malignancy, but still, I want to be provocative, right? I said I want to, to add spicy. Are we using this biomarker right now? We are not. So this is where we are going, 100%. If I have the money on research, I will put on this, because in the future, we will need a biomarker easy to access, cheap and reliable, and we will use it, exactly. I am sure. But right now, what we're doing is here in the clinic, myself, a patient, an MRI, we have a C90.9. As Johanny said, we can have a CEA in the cyst and we have the decision making and still we are full of doubts. So that's why I wanted to focus on the policy of today, which is when you have a cyst, don't hurry up. You have time, you have time to study. If you find jaundice, if you find nodules with contrast, then go to surgery. But the vast majority of cysts don't have these features. So take your time to see the biology because the biology is always king. And then in the future, we'll have biomarkers, hopefully. And you mean biology is always much more important than the other markers like uh, radiology or the it's dimension it's or guidance? That's what the movie will tell you, Professor. As you know, as you know, if you watch a cyst, the very first follow-up, keep it after just six months. So if something is happening, you have time to go to surgery. If you see that the cyst is dilating, that the features are coming, then something is going on. What is the, less, what is the um, least harmful time span between follow-up period? For example, if you see the patient, when would you like to see it again to make your decision in terms of uh, the biological behavior of cyst? So the, the, the first follow-up is always six months because you, okay. you want to be very careful. Sometimes, you know, patients are referred to you coming from other places. So you need to have time to have a good MRI with contrast. You know, you need to have time maybe to get endoscopic ultrasound. So the first visit is not one day. Sometimes it takes weeks. But then after you got your scans, then you want to have no more than six months. So I, I'm very careful because I'm scared. I don't want to miss a cancer, of course. Okay. But then after this, if it's stable, you can lengthen it to one year. And then if nothing going on, you can go up to 18 months and then two years. Okay. But I mean, at the beginning, be very, very careful. Okay. Um, there is one more question from Ankara, from good friend of mine, Mutlu Donai. And how many uh, surgical or endosonographical criteria uh, uh, do we need to make our decision in terms of follow-up or uh, surgery? Just one uh, criteria or more than one? Or just biology is, biology is the only one? Or do you need any supportive data or the, any supportive criteria to make your decision? So I, 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 when you scale the pros and cons, right? It's not like yeah. black and white. You always have some factors playing a role. So we know there are factors that, are, that have a bigger weight. So above all, jaundice, obstructive jaundice. When you have that, 99% of the time you have cancer in there. So that's a, that's a pretty easy, okay, sign to be assessed. Then another one, which is an absolute indication for surgery is for example, the duct dilated of more than a centimeter, which is very important. Ioanni said that, okay? Mm -hmm. So of course I am in favor of this factor, but let me be provo provocative once again. Would you rely just on the duct, a dilation of the duct with no other feature I would be less aggressive in this case because you know that dilation of the duct does not equal main duct IPMN. So you want to be sure that the duct is dilated because there is an IPMN. Sometimes you have a mass dilating a duct, sometimes you have chronic pancreatitis, sometimes you're wrong. So in, in order to answer to your question, when you have multiple factors, you have to put them like a puzzle and see what you have. Once again, uh, the truth does not come from one single factor, but keeping all the elements together and by checking and checking again, like the picture and the movie I show you, okay? okay. But again, the, the, the answers coming from surgical series are tricky 
Because if you look at the factors in the surgical series, you are only see part of the truth. Of course, the cysts resected are resected for a reason, right? But when you have a cyst in front of you, which means a patient, you don't have those factors because those patient is not operating, okay? okay. So we always need to be careful. That's why I say, let's watch the movie. Let's see what happens. Biology will tell us. Okay. Giovanni, another question from Ankara, from Sedat Karademir, Professor Sedat Karademir. He would like to know, he need to know, how about the patient, how about if the patient wouldn't like to live with the low uh, grade uh, cystic lesion, in spite of your explanations, trying to convince him or her to follow up, and if she or he would like to go to surgery, would you do an, would you perform a surgery instead of the follow up? This is a great question. I love it because, of course, I have no answer whatsoever. Okay, so <laughs> that's why you love it. Then. <laughs> I, no, yeah, I love it because it's the, it's the great part of our job, right? We're not technician in the OR. I, I, yeah. I see I see way more patient than those that I bring to the operating room. As, as I am in charge for the cyst clinic, I see 99% of the patient that are for, let's say, gastroenterologists, but I like to be a pancreatologist or maybe a pancreatologist because I love the cyst. But, and this means that I always have to take time to share with my patient the pros and the cons. So listen, you want your cyst out. Okay, no problem. Do you know the price of this? Because if I bring you to operating room, it means that it's for an oncologic resection. We never perform non-oncological resection for cyst because in Verona, this makes no sense. Okay, so if, if I bring you to operating room, it means that I fear that you have a cancer. Maybe I get dysplasia, but you have a cancer. So I take you all the lymph node and I take all the tissue that I need. I do frozen section, I do things the best way possible, okay? So if I do this to you, you know that even if we are a very high volume center, risk for mortality is between two to 3%. During the COVID time, maybe more, okay? But it's not only mortality, it's also the morbidity. It's fistula, it's diabetes. For example, when you have a cyst, the pancreas is soft, the duct is small. What is the likelihood of having a fistula for, with a soft pancreas as a small duct? It's, it's high. And as Professor Deveni taught us, there are many complications after pancreatic surgery. Okay, so I, I, I start to share this and sometimes the patient is like, oh, maybe I like my cyst more. Maybe I, I keep it. I will see in six months. You, you, you need to give time also to the patient to understand the pros and the cons. It's more tricky when we have like a young lady with a cyst in the body tail and the cyst is big, can be mucinous and the patient is young. So she has to go for follow-up for the entire, entire life, can be many years. And you can do, for example, a very nice robotic resection of the tail. This, I, I, I'm even more, you know, in, in trouble because if she says, I want this to be out, then again, the pros and the cons is not like a big whipple, right? It's different operations. So there is not a single answer for every cases. It's very tailored on the specific situation. Yeah, one of our young HPV surgeons from Istanbul, Abdi Cem Ibish, Cem Ibish um, he prefers not to operate the patient if um, he believes in follow-up instead of surgery. I mean, um, he thinks that it is important to make surgeons' decisions up instead of the patient's decision. The surgeon's decisions should be first. Uh, what do you think? Mm, I, I am much in favor of a patient's decision once well informed by the surgeon. Because, uh, you know, medicine now is very tricky, you know, they, uh, for example, a lawyer can come to you and, and ask you, did you follow the guidelines, for example? Mm -hmm. And if you didn't follow the guidelines, you might be in trouble. So the only way I think to be less in trouble, because we are always in trouble, we, we, we chose this job, so we know we'll always be in trouble, is to share the decision with the patient. I know that some of, particularly the older patient, you know, they can say, doctor, you decide, whatever you say, it's fine to me. But this is a little bit risky. It's always good to share also what you don't know, not always what you know with your patient. And this is difficult. It takes time. Sometimes the patient does not understand. The patient went to Google 
and find Dr. Google telling, oh, pancreas, cancer, you're dead, okay? But I mean, this is the, the, the beauty and the tough part of our job. I would be much in favor of always taking the time to talk to your patient and to share as much as possible what is known and what is not known about the cyst. Okay. With cancer, it's easier. It's not easy, but it's easier with cancer. Of course. It's, it's not easy. Of course. Okay. Thank you, Giovanni and Yanis. And finally, uh, um, Professor Darius, would you prefer to say a couple of words or make a comment for both speakers in terms uh, as a very experienced surgeon? Um, thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. Uh, first, I would like to thank you, all of you, all, all of our friends in Turkey. And I would like to say that we miss you all. And then I think that uh, next time we see each other closely and uh, yeah. person in person instead of <laughs> using, instead, <laughs> instead of using because, uh, because I, I, I cannot replace your hospitality anytime. I mean, uh, apart from your scientific quality, I enjoy being with you. So it's, this is, I would like to say it because of, you know, all, all of us, we, are living with the consequences of this this uh, COVID pandemic. So next time, I hope that we'll uh, meet in person. Yeah. So uh, then I would like to congratulate both speakers. Um, uh, this is the the new blood, and I can, I see with um, with pleasure that this new blood is uh, far more better than us, and they they understand the situation better than us, and they have the the abilities to uh, to go further our pancreatic uh, surgery. So I congratulate both. Um, everything has been said, in fact, and uh, the only thing that I would like to uh, make as a final comment of this discussion is um, uh, that we are dealing with a, a situation that there is um, uh, the evidence that we have are not very strong. So this is so far, they need to have so many. Giovanni used to say that if we don't have evidence, then we have uh, guidelines. And then, uh, of course, they are useful, and it's come out from the the, um, the research, the clinical research, and the experience. But still, we need uh, more evidence. Um, but uh, I can say that uh, the future is, as Giovanni said, the future is um, the molecular biology. Uh, um, I believe that uh, so far it's uh, it's not, unfortunately, because there is a lot of work that have been done, but uh, nothing is clinical um, uh, practical, uh, so we cannot use it. Um, but uh, so far we use what we uh, what we know, and what we know is that um, we we have a balance. We, as usual, we should take a decision based on a balance. And when one side we have the disease, and the other side we have the patient and the consequences of the pancreatic surgery. Giovanni said very clearly that pancreatic surgery is not an easy uh, surgery. So we should think twice when we advise the patient go into the operation room. Um, uh, the other thing is that I would like to stress is that it's very important that we, uh, we, um, we hesitated to, to say it, but this is a, the, uh, the situation of the so-called the concomitant pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. And this is, as Giovanni gave us the information, it's not a rare situation. I mean, the pancreatic cancer is not always related to the IPMN. It's, it's, a, it's a total different entity in a patient having IPMN, which is not the, the, the same situation. So please, everybody looking at the cyst, don't, don't uh, avoid to see in the pancreas as a whole, because you can realize sometimes that you are a cancer which is not related to IPMN. Finally, I would like to, uh, to agree uh, with Giovanni and every, everyone that uh, um, support the idea of uh, discussing with the patient. I mean, this is very important in any case. Uh, Giovanni started with Hippocrates. Hippocrates used to say that every, every doctor and every surgeon should take time with the patient. 
discuss it, especially in situations that we know we don't have, um, uh, we, you are not very, how to say, very safe with our decision. We have uncertainties and uh, we are living with these uncertainties until we solve them. So uh, you should give the, the, um, the patient all the details, the information, uh, and then uh, because it, oh, as the disease is not the same, nor the patients are all the same. They have a, a, a different conception of surgery. Other patients said, okay, I don't, I, don't, um, uh, I, I don't want to have surgery. I don't care about that. Um, other others very he hesitated to have surgery. So, I mean, I think that we should discuss it, give all the information, the pros and cons, and decide together. So I think this is very important and especially in the IPMN it's very important. So I don't want to take um, more from your time because everything has been said. I would like to congratulate both speakers. I would like to thank you Ilgin and Ahmed and the Turkish ASPB um, Association. I'm very honored and I'm very happy that I've be, I consider myself one of you. So thank you and um, take care. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, thank you for everyone who um, att who attends this meeting. And Ilgin, would you like to say any closure, closing remarks or just uh, close the session? We are grateful to Dr. Papas and Dr. Marcia Gianni for their intellectually stimulating and using, borrowing a word from Dr. Marcia Gianni, provocative speeches. Uh, they told us what we already know, and also they have shown us the path forward. And I thank uh, uh, very much uh, Professor Dervenis and Professor Choker. And as I said before, we will have more of these meetings in the future. And some of our local meetings will be available through simultaneous translation from Turkish to English. So we would always be welcome your intellectual guidance and stimulus to these meetings. We okay. look forward to meeting you in the short future. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good night. See you on Wednesday. Don't forget, okay? Thank you. I will. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Austin. Giovanni, great job. Thank you, guys. Hope to Thank see you, Giovanni. Thank you. Thank you.